Good morning, everyone. It is Thursday in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Adam Bittner, assistant sports editor at the Post Gazette, joined today by Paul Zeiss, back from vacation for our latest Zeiss is Right video. Paul, how are you feeling? I hope you're refreshed and ready for another 16 weeks of football. Rest, rested, relaxed, and ready to go for sure. And uh, you know what? Uh, couldn't have happened at a better time because, as you just said, uh, the football marathon is getting ready to start. Well, Paul, let's just get right into it with the uh, the topic here at the top of the show, which is uh, Broderick Jones um, and Dan Moore Jr. It's it's the controversy that's raging. Dan Moore Jr. has gotten some terrible grades uh, from Pro Football Focus and just generally bad reviews. Um, you know, even if you're just observing his plays, um, and, and a lot of people are ready to see the rookie um, take over that tackle spot and. Um, where do you land on that, Paul? Or are you ready to see that as well? I, I kind of am. I've, I was willing to listen to the theory that oh, they got these tough pass rushers. You'd rather have a veteran guy in there at least to start, and then you can, you know, then you can get Broderick Jones' feet wet. Um, but I don't think that theory's really held up, and, and I think it's time. Um, I, I would say this. I think that you know the, 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 the offensive line has not been good in general. Now, whether that's the tackles or the guards or some combination of, 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 of that, I mean, the offensive line has been a, a problem. Now, will putting a rookie in there necessarily solve that problem? Adam, I don't know. I don't know what the case is. All I can go by is this. The Steelers coaches watch these two guys compete all training camp and came to the conclusion, and they never wavered, by the way, that Dan Moore gave them the best chance to win. So um, I understand the sentiment. People are frustrated with the offense. They're frustrated with what's going on right now. But I'm in the camp that the offensive line generally takes four, five, sometimes six weeks to really fully come together. And so if you put a new element in there, it might you know, slow that process along. Now, I will say this. If it doesn't get better this week and maybe, you know, maybe I go one more week, then yeah, then it's probably time to make some sort of a change. But I don't necessarily know that it's Dan Moore that has to go. That's the, that's the big thing. Um, I think that both of the guards have had moments where they've been okay and other moments where they've not been so good. I think we've seen Chooks have some good moments and some really bad moments too. So uh, I, I think that, you know, everybody wants change when things aren't going well. But I don't like the idea of change just to change. If you're going to tell me that you think Broderick Jones is better than Dan Moore, okay. If he's proven that he's better than Dan Moore, okay. But is it Dan Moore that's really the weak point, the weak link? Is it maybe you move Dan Moore to the right and put Broderick Jones at the left? Um, or God forbid... How about leave Dan Moore alone and put Broderick Jones on the right side? You know, and Chooks is the guy that's out. So there's a lot of ways that you can do it, but I don't necessarily think it's necessary right now to make that move because, to me, the Steelers have uh, – is it Chuck Knoll or who was it that said Steelers have, uh, the Steelers have problems and they are great or the Steelers have many problems and they are great or something like that? There's a lot going on with his, with his offense. Um, that I don't know that necessarily switching a tackle out is really going to change. Paul, on his podcast, and I bring it up because you and I, we love good TV. That's the term I use for, for drama, interesting stuff. We love good TV. Ben Roethlisberger's podcast, whatever you think of him as a player, uh, whatever you thought of him as in the locker room for the Steelers for all those years, um, his podcast is good TV. And he said that Dan Moore Jr. is killing it. Um, on his podcast is is he watching something different than we're watching <laughs> or or is that just a, a guy trying to boost up one of his former teammates while the whole town is kind of piling on him it's been the contrarian being been the contrarian isn't it i mean last year when he played was no i guess it was two years ago this is is this dan moore's third year or second year this is his third, year, third right? year yeah so yeah. he played his first year a little bit with ben so if you remember, people were destroying Dan Moore. And, of course, that meant Ben had to come to his rescue. And 
Ben and him, you know, sort of befriended each other and everything else. And so Ben's narrative about Dan Moore since day one is that we are all idiots, that Dan Moore is playing really well, and that uh, we don't know football. That's his stick. That's been his stick since the first day he was a he, he since the first day someone put a microphone in his face when he was a rookie for the Steelers. That's been his stick. It's it's you know contrarian. It's passive aggressive stuff. It's you guys don't know football and I do. But he does it in a way where, you know what? You don't kind of you you, you know how there's some people that are really condescending to you, and they do it in a way where you. It takes you a, a while, and then maybe you walk away and you think about it. And you're like, well, boy, that was really condescending. But while they're doing it to you, right, it doesn't register. That's how Ben is. He's very good at being condescending, being contrarian, being really passive aggressive, and making it so that you don't kind of feel like, wow, uh, you know, until afterwards. And then you start thinking about, okay, this is Ben being Ben. So that's a long way to say it's Ben being Ben, the contrarian, and I don't really believe that he believes that Ben that Dan Moore is killing it. Yeah, I don't either. I think he's he's just boosting up his teammate, um, you know, while he's still got teammates in the NFL, right? Um, Paul, I, you you pulled at this thread a little bit. You mentioned that Dan Moore is not the only problem. Um, who else is most on your radar? You mentioned the two guards. Um, Who's on your radar and what moves would you potentially consider there to kind of revamp the way things are going? Um, just because, you know, the, the, I, Dan Moore is getting all the scrutiny, but I think there are, you know, broad problems on the line. If you looked at the pro football focus grades, the Steelers are last by a mile, and that's not all Dan Moore's fault, right? No, it's not. Like I said, all, uh, the guard, the two guards and, 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 and Chooks have all had moments where they've looked okay but they've also had moments where they haven't been very good. I don't think they've been particularly good uh, run blocking. They've had moments where they've been okay. Um, and pass blocking, I don't know that they've been asked to do a whole lot of pass blocking by this offense. Uh, I, I, I would say that to me, I don't know that you go to the point where you replace some people, but I do think you need to really take a look at, um, take a look at, the um, the play calling that you're doing and whether or not it's putting these guys in the best position to be successful. That's where I would start. And, and I guess it's kind of a subtle way. We're going to get into it in a little bit here at Matt Canada. But uh, to me, are the plays that you're running, the running plays that you're running, for instance, are they taking advantage of what your offensive line does well? You know, are your passing plays, are they playing to the strengths of your offensive line? Or are you rolling Kenny Pickett into pressure? Are you rolling, you know, him away from where he would be protected? I mean, there's a lot of different elements to really good offensive line play. Uh, and then you've got your tight ends. Are, are they helping? Um, are they, you know, when, it, when they're called on the block, are they helping? And your running backs, are they helping? I mean, there's a lot to the protection aspect when it comes to trying to figure out what the problems are. And that's why I say, you got to give it another week or two just to kind of see if this offensive line, the more they play together, the better they get. That's what I would tell you is, is, is my take on, on the offensive line. I don't know that you're at a place where you want to make changes right now, but you certainly have to monitor it and see and make sure that it's getting better. Yeah. I think you need cohesion above, above all else, Paul. And I think that's the thing that's very obviously lacking. This was a group that was not bad last season, definitely took strides in the right direction. Now it looks like it's gone backwards. And I think the easy thing to blame is you've got some new faces and and you haven't built the cohesion. And yeah, I think some of that falls on Matt Canada, um, you know, and, and the coaching staff for, for not building that. Um, but you know, some of it falls on the players as well. So we'll see how that develops, but I, I think making wholesale changes, only disrupts the attempts to, to build that cohesion. So uh, I'm right there with you. Um, Paul, I want to get into briefly the Joey Porter, Levi Wallace situation, because I think it's similar to what we've got going on with Dan Moore Jr. Um, and Broderick Jones. How much, when do you think we should see Joey Porter getting the majority of these reps here? Um, you know, I, I think Levi Wallace is always going to have a place in this defense. You need, I think, three solid corners. So I don't think he's going to be like suddenly off the field. He's not going to be benched. 
But when do you want to see Joey Porter be, you know, getting at least half of those snaps on the outside? Well, here's the difference between Dan Moore and and uh, and Levi Wallace. I think Levi, Levi Wallace is off to a horrific start to this season. I think he's been bad. You know, I wish I could say that he's been solid or average or anything like that, but I think he's been bad. I would start Joey Porter this week. No questions asked. Joey Porter would start this week, um, and, I, and I would see what he can do for the whole game. I'd say, Joey, this is your game. It, it, go out there and prove that you can be an NFL corner, and if you are, you'll never look back. Use Levi Wallace in the slot or as your third corner or whatever, but he has not been good at all. And I thought the other day he got torched a bunch in that game against Cleveland, and, and I just think that he's a guy you know what he is. That's probably the problem with him. You know what he is. You know what his ceiling is. I mean, you can at least – Somewhat make the case that Dan Moore Jr. is still a relatively young player that might have more of a ceiling than we haven't seen, right? Levi Wallace is who he is. And so, to me, I would start Joey Porter Jr. this week. And if he plays well, plays reasonably well, he would be the starter for the rest of the year, and that would be the end of that discussion. I don't think it's the same as the Broderick Jones you know, uh, Dan Moore situation. Cause I, at first, for one thing, we've seen Joey Porter play a little bit. He's played a little bit and he's kind of proven, you know, a little bit at a time that he can do the job. We've never seen Broderick Jones play. So that's the problem is, is that I, I think that when you try and compare the two, probably it's not comparable. The other part of it is Dan Moore Jr. has been a lot better at his job than Levi Wallace has been at his job. So to me, it's a no brainer, Adam. It's time. Yeah, I, I like what Joey Porter brought. There was some energy, and and I think I mean that's why you. I was talking about this with Chris on the North Shore Drive on Wednesday that you know you don't draft these guys at positions of need to not play them, and and especially when they're making plays in crucial spots. And that's what you that's what you drafted them to do. It's time to let them do that. Uh, Paul, I want to get your thoughts on Kenny Pickett, yeah. Matt Cameron, and the offense because we didn't get to hear them the other night because you weren't on the post game show. Um, so I'm going to set you up with that in a second. But quickly, I just want to thank our sponsor. Uh, Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. There's no better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on energy costs year-round. Schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella Windows and Doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project further. That's 866-593-1560 to get started planning on your new windows and doors installation with Pella Windows and Doors of Pittsburgh. Um, Paul, I mean, other than the, the Dan Moore and, and Broderick Jones situation, the, the big topic of conversation, just generally speaking, is that this offense looks like a mess. Um, there's blame for Kenny Pickett. There's blame for Matt Canada on a play calling level. Um, I think there's blame for for how these guys have been coached up. Um, you know, I think you can even come up with some blame for the receivers. So, um, what is your thirty thousand foot view of of what is wrong here, and and who is most to blame for the issues we've seen through these first two games? <laughs> well, I, I'll say this. Most to blame is Matt Canada because he's the coach. He's the offensive coach. And quite frankly, Adam, and I'm going to kind of throw this back to you real quick. Is there any part of the offense that looks well coached? No, no. And, and I said this, I said this on the North Shore Drive as well. It does not look coordinated. And, and that's the job. Look Players need to execute. I get it. Players need to make plays. I get it. But this offense is a total failure from start to finish. And a lot of it has to do with the scheme is bad, right? This isn't college football. The route trees for the receivers don't make sense. The play calling is is amateur hour, okay? When you watch, for instance, I mean, forget about the 49ers, because I think Cal Shanahan and that, they, they're very, very good at what they do. So let's go. I don't believe that Kevin Stefanski is is, is uh, this, like, super football guru, but he's a pretty good offensive mind, right? And But if you watch their offense, it at least made sense. Now, I think Deshaun Watson stinks, and that's their problem. And they also lost Nick Chubb, and that's a big problem. But at the end of the day, 
their offense makes sense. The Steelers offense doesn't make sense. I could come up with, if we sat here and we went, you know, I put the film back there on the wall. And so let's go through a bunch of these plays and you tell me what made sense about this play. There's so many of them where I'd say this is a, this was a bad play call at a bad time. The play caller doesn't have a good feel for calling plays. That's number one. Number two, he doesn't have a good feel for the passing game. He never has, which is what makes this so confusing to me. Confusing why they made him the the the, the offensive uh, the off uh, the quarterback coach. All right, when when his strength is actually the run game, and then made him the offensive coordinator when you draft another young quarterback. Makes no sense. My point is. That's where it starts. The, the offensive coordinator is not good enough. He's got 15 games to try and get it right. I don't, I don't know that he will. I don't have a lot of faith. We've seen enough of the body of work to say, hey, it, you know, he's probably not going to get it right. But he's still got 15 games, so I'm willing to, to say, well, maybe he'll fix some things. Um, the protection of the offensive line hadn't been good, but the, the second biggest culprit has been Kenny Pickett. He hadn't been good enough. He's missing too many good thro- easy throws. He's missing too many throws. He's, he's holding the ball too long at times. He's staring down receivers at times. It doesn't even look like the same guy. You know, and, and again, it could be just, um, you know, he's, he's a little shell shock because the offensive line hadn't been good, whatever. But the other part of that is I'm not sure why he gets a complete pass in terms of the coaching staff. Like you've got a viable backup that should at least be starting to get into the conversation of, you know what, if this doesn't get better, we're going to use our back. We're going to put Trubisky in there. Uh, I'm not saying they're there yet. But I talked to some people who act like, you know, there's no way in the world that that, that Kenny Pickett should be replaced. I, I don't know if we're there either because outside of two drives last year at the end of games, both in the two-minute drill, which had a little bit of a flukish element to both, outside of that, have we seen any evidence that Kenny Pickett is this high-level quarterback that some people want so badly for him to be? I'm not saying he isn't, but he hasn't proven that. Oh, yeah. The other- I- I've been I've been talking about those two drives as being overweighted in people's minds, um, you know, pretty much since the offseason started. It's you, you don't dismiss those results, but the sample size of them was small, and and they came at the end of games where, you know, the the, the Steelers did not play well offensively. That Raiders game finished thirteen to ten. Paul, it was ten to six before he led that game winning drive. That's not right. you know that's not good enough. Um, and, and neither was the game against the Ravens. And, and just because they won, because the defense, like they did Monday, put them in position, does not mean that, that you just forget everything that came before that. When it was Ben Roethlisberger and he had a much more proven body of work and maybe went out there and stank for three quarters and then he led a couple great fourth quarter drives, then you say, okay, well, that's Ben, that's ben being Ben. Without that body of work behind him yet, I think people did put a little too much stock in – you know, those two drives and and the pr- five drives in the preseason to say, hey, this guy's ready to take a big breakout step. I I, I have to see that to believe it. And that's not to say that I, I don't think he can be a serviceable quarterback. But these comparisons to Joe Burrow, I've seen some people say uh, he could be the next Josh Allen. He's better than Josh Allen because Josh <laughs> Allen played like crap in the, in the Jets game. Pump the brakes. Yeah, I mean, again, I like Kenny, and I hope he does well, and I think he'll do well. I see he's got talent, but I have seen no evidence to, where he, where I say, well, he's definitely the guy, you know, for the long haul. I, I would hope he is, and I think he's, you know, got a lot of the good elements to be that guy. Here's the other thing, um, Adam. What did I say in the preseason was the one area that they did not do a very good job of fortifying? The receivers. The receivers. I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that in a, in a second here too. Oh, okay. Well, then I didn't realize. I thought that. Well, I thought Gunnar Osevsky was a receiver, but you, we were talking about what's wrong with the offense. Yeah. Um, the offensive line hasn't been good. Najee Harris is just sort of a, you know, he's a little above average running back, but he's not special. There's nothing special that he does. He doesn't have breakaway speed. He doesn't have, you know, 
any like real elusive moves. He's a pretty good guy getting north south. You know, he'll break tackles here and there, but he's not anything special. Period. Yeah, so, I, I to me, you've got kind of a, a pedestrian running get running back, you know, and Jalen Warren to me is very similar. I know he's the flavor of the month, but he's very similar. You've got an offensive line that right now isn't playing very well. A quarterback who has a hell of a lot to prove. And an offensive coordinator doesn't seem to know what the hell he's doing. That is probably a formula for really, really, really where we're at right now with the Steelers offense. Let's get into the receivers, Paul, because you and I have taken a lot of abuse in the YouTube comments on this channel. <laughs> that we're, we're not quite sure about this, this group as a unit yet. What have you seen from them? Have you seen enough of Gunnar Olszewski, um, you know, after the way he played Monday night? And, and is he maybe the example of what you were talking about in terms of, you know, okay, maybe George Pickens can be good. Maybe Calvin Austin can be a serviceable facsimile of Deontay Johnson, but the depth of this receiver group is just not where you'd want it to be. He's exactly what I was talking about, Adam. Exactly what I was talking about. What did I say? Allen Robinson is just a guy. He'll just be a guy because, you know, he was once a really good receiver. But there's a reason he was available, right? And he was available at the price he was available for. Um, so I I said that. You, you know, I said basically George Pickens is is going to be their guy. And you know what? He's he's done some really good things in, in, the, in the first two games, right? He had the 71-yard touchdown and whatnot. But they're not using him nearly enough, and they're probably, you know, uh, uh, not doing a good job of giving him a real opportunity uh, to make big plays, which is what he needs. Uh, but he is who kind of I thought he was. But I said if either him or Deontay Johnson go down, then what? You know, Calvin Austin has been pretty much what I thought he was going to be. Training camp sensation, superstar, you know, ridiculous training camp guy who probably is just going to sort of be okay. And, you know, he had the one catch, didn't he have one catch uh, on the sideline, if I'm not mistaken, where he made a really nice catch for a first down. But, you know, as far as him running all over the place and, you know, you know scoring touchdowns and jet sweeps and all the other stuff, it's just not going to happen. You know, he's, he's, he's what he is. And then I said, beyond those four, I don't even know what you're looking at. Gunnar uh, Olszewski, I mean, <laughs> he's exactly what I told you. After Calvin Austin, which I'm not even sure what level he's at, the drop-off is significant. Now, what do they have? Him, Miles Boykin, who else do they even have? I mean, they did not address receiver the receiver room in the offseason. And it shows. And it now it really shows when Deontay Johnson's out and you're running guys like Gunnar Olszewski out there because you don't have anybody else. It's, it's not a good formula. And I said it at the start. I'll say it again. You have George Pickens, who has a chance to be a superstar if they use him the right way. You have Deontay Johnson, who, you know, is a good, legitimate, solid number two NFL receiver. After that, you have a little. After that, you have a whole bunch of questions. Yeah, Paul, I want to co-sign that point about George Pickens. They've been feeding him the ball, but they haven't really been putting him in a, in a great position to, to make those plays. He, I think he had like eight targets and three catches. He had a great night, 101 yards receiving. He had that long touchdown. That's great, but he definitely does not seem like he's totally on the same page with Kenny Pickett or this offense. Considering you know five, he. he caught fewer than half the balls that were thrown to him, um, you know, and, and that's that's a sign of dysfunction too. And that's not saying that I don't think George Pickens can be a solid receiver. It's just that there's something wrong with that connection, even though it, it did produce some results the other night. Um, Paul, we're going to get into some pit talk here. Uh, I really want to hear your thoughts on the backyard brawl. Uh, before we do, just want to thank a couple more sponsors, Goldberg, Persky, and White. If you were diagnosed with mesothelioma or lung cancer, call your local attorneys at Goldberg, Persky, and White. For over 40 years, their firm has represented thousands of lung cancer and mesothelioma victims. Call 1-800-COMPLEX or visit gpwlaw.com for a free consultation. Also, thank you to Propel Schools, Propel's 13 public charter schools in Allegheny County. Build a solid academic foundation for lifelong learning and offer more personalized instruction at every level of your child's 
kindergarten through 12th grade education journey. Give your children the quality education they deserve. Learn more and apply at Propel Schools by, vi by visiting propelschools.org. Um, Paul, that the back as, as big of a mess as the Steelers offense looked in on Monday night against the 49ers. Um, there were times on, on Saturday night watching the backyard brawl where they could have played eight quarters, and I don't know if Pitt would have scored a touchdown. I mean, that's sure. how bleak it felt uh, with Phil Dracovic. Um, what do you make of, of that situation and, um, you know, where Pitt goes from here? Um, how long can they tolerate quarterback play like this? Well, first of all, Adam, you're coming off back-to-back -back weeks where you lost to two of probably the four worst teams in the Big 12. So that's not good. Regardless of what you know, I mean, that's not good. Um, I don't think – I think this week against um, – I think, I think this week against North Carolina, if the offense is as bad as it was or as bad as it's been, and Pat Narduzzi doesn't give the other kid, what's his name, Christian Vail or whatever his name is, doesn't give him a chance. And, in fact, I would probably, if I were Pat Narduzzi and Frank Signetti, I would probably give the Veo kid. Is that how you pronounce his name, Veo, the, the Penn State kid? Uh, I've heard I've heard eight hundred different things, Paul. I, I hear Noah Heil says it Veyer. So Veyer, okay. These so, are so, these are B reporters, so that's what I'm rolling with. But that's so, on a so so the kid uh, so Veyer. So my point is, if I'm Narduzzi and 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 Signetti, I'm giving him reps with the first team this week, and I'm not going to be afraid to make a move if. We get, you know, into the third quarter and we the, the, the team's still struggling to score a touchdown or move the football um, because West Virginia is not good. That's the worst part about that. They're not good. And all it would have taken is Dracovic just to have one or two lucid drives where he looked like a quarterback in command. But, but what I see is a quarterback who has completely lost confidence He's unsure of what he's doing. He's thinking too much. He's out there. He's trying to make stuff happen that isn't going to happen. It is important. It is important for a quarterback to have some semblance of confidence. And he doesn't have any right now. And so, you know, and the whole thing about it is you, 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 you then you compound the issue when you call out pit fans and then after you have another terrible performance, you don't talk to the media. Now it wasn't his call. It was Narduzzi's call, but still that, that to me just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. What do you make of this? I think on one track, you have the terrible offensive performance on the other track. They seem indignant that people are upset about it. You know, yeah. the boo city comment from Pat Narduzzi calling Pittsburgh boo city. Um, uh, it, referring to the fans as, you know, people in their basement. I'm sorry, Paul. I'm going to go on a bit of a rant here. Pitt has had problems with attendance, but it's not the people who show up to the games that are the problem with the attendance or the fan base. Or I mean, those are the people who invest the most in this program. And he's out here referring to them as Boo City and the people who are on, the, on, on Twitter in their basement. And I just think that that's, that's – it seems like the bigger rival – and through these first couple of weeks has not been Cincinnati and the river city, whatever they called it, not West Virginia in the backyard brawl. The people they seem most fired up at are their own fans for calling them out for how this team has looked through three weeks. Right. And it's their fault. Cause that's the way they play. It's 100% their fault. And I think that's the problem. And, and I, I, I get to a point where I look like, for instance, Kenny Pickett was asked about, you know, uh, fans uh, booing or whatever, you know, fans getting disgruntled with the offense. And you know what his answer was today? His answer was something like, well, I'm sorry. Uh, his answer was something like, um, well, they're upset because they're passionate and they should be upset. We're upset. <laughs> we want to get better too. We want to play better. They want us to play better. In other words, that's called being a grown up, right? You're not playing well. You know fans want you to play well. Instead of blaming the fans, you basically just say, look, we're upset too, and we understand it. Um, you know, Pat Narduzzi is always sort of, you know, he's one of these guys that has a chip on his shoulder about everything. He always does. That's, a, that's sort of how he gets his edge. 
you know, and, and to a degree, I think every coach probably finds ways to act like they're disrespected or whatever in order to get themselves motivated. But this is a horrible look for him because this fan base has been very supportive of him. Um, they've been very supportive of his program. And the bottom line is you laid a complete egg against Cincinnati and you played terribly. And then you can, you went out and you did it again in the backyard brawl and God forbid, I, 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 I keep telling myself they're going to play a good game this week and it won't happen, but God forbid, if we're sitting at the end of the first quarter, it's 14, nothing North Carolina. We're gonna, you, you think it's Boo City last week. Wait till you see what happens then. Um, so to me, I wish that Pat Narduzzi would use a little bit more humility here. And I wish that this whole situation was handled a whole lot better than it was. Because it's an embarrassment when you're calling out your fans, when they're the ones that are paying money to come watch you play, and you're not performing. Yeah, it's not calling out fans like, hey, why aren't you here? You're calling out the people that are there. And, and the, you know, I went to that Penn, uh, Pitt, Virginia game when they clinched the ACC division title a couple of years ago. And and the joy on those people's faces and, and, and the belief in the program and all, I mean, those people are the true believers. They want to be there. They love coming out. And if you're going to alienate them, you know, you're alienating the people that are coming out to see you, not the people who just like, you know, sit on their couch and, and don't come out to the games and, and just have a bunch of opinions that he was talking about the people in the stadium. And I think that that I agree with you, Paul is a horrible look um, in terms of, of the quarterback situation structurally. Was it a mistake for him to calculate that uh, the best way to keep the Kenny Pickett, you know, ACC title winning window open is to go out and get these guys who've been with other programs and in, in Phil Dracovic's case, a couple of programs now, and, and think that they are the solution rather than homegrown guys or, or players that, that you've you know recruited hard recently. Because um, to me, it, it was that that pit team that won the ACC title was very homegrown. And uh, listen, I know that the transfer portal is a thing now. You're gonna have to bring guys in through through the portal, um, and, and so it's it's not a matter of oh, you, it should be every every position needs to be staffed by someone who went to Pitt, but it just feels like they've gone the mercenary route for lack of a better term. And, and that that was a miscalculation, um, at least in terms of the guys he picked to come in here. Well, that, I think that last part, you know, it's not necessarily a big deal that they went out and got transfers because there's good players and there's bad players. I think Keaton Slovis was a bad fit. He's, he's at BYU and he's doing well there. You know, it's a different culture, a different atmosphere there. It's, you know, he's a West coast guy. I get it. It actually worked for him there. This was a horrible fit for him. Um, in Djokovic's case, the jury's out. They thought they were getting a good player, but so far he hasn't played well. Now, that could change, really. You know, he could go out and they could beat North Carolina and everything. People are going to forget about everything. That's just how it is. But I don't necessarily think the problem is that he went out and got a mercenary or went out and got a transfer quarterback. I just think it, so far it looks like he's gotten in the last two years the wrong quarterback. Because remember, they went out and got Nate Peterman. He turned out to be a pretty good player for them. I mean, they've used this model where they try and find a quarterback that is, you know, Pickett was really their only homegrown like, quarterback, I think, uh, in this whole entire eight years or nine years that they've had or whatever. For the most part, they've had transfers of quarterback. So it's just a matter of if they got to get the right guy. Uh, I would like to see them do a, the homegrown thing like Penn State is doing right now. But the other part of that equation is Penn State was capable of going out and getting a five-star kid to commit to have waiting in the wings. Um, so I, I don't necessarily have a problem with the process. I just I just think maybe they picked the wrong guys. Well, I mean, to that point, though, Paul, before Drew Aller, you had um, Sean Clifford, who was not the most highly recruited guy. You had Trace McSorley, who nobody but Vanderbilt wanted when – um, you know, when, when James Franklin was there and then he switched his commitment, came to Penn State. And those guys are going to go down as two old timers as well, just like Pickett did. Um, you know, I, I just wonder if he maybe should have given the guys that were in his locker room, Nick Patty, um, Nate Yarnell now, just give them more of a chance to compete as opposed to anointing these guys. There's no problem with bringing them in, but they don't have it. I mean, you should be able to see this in practice, right? People have pointed this out on, on Twitter, you know, if, if he goes out and looks that way against West Virginia, there's no way you didn't see something signaling that during the week. Well, I'll tell you this. I watched, 
a full practice last year and during training camp. You know, because I do the pregame show for Pitt. So, they, you know, we're allowed to go over there one day, you know, as they have like a, you know, broadcaster day or whatever. So, you know, uh, Bill Hillgrove, you know, Larry Richard, all of us that are a part of, you know, the crew, we go over there. And we... So, uh, this year I couldn't make it. I forget what day it was. It was sorry, I couldn't do it. But but I was there to see Keaton Slovis play. And I came away saying this. This kid might be one of the best quarterbacks that Pitt has ever had. Because he looked that good, even when they played 11 on 11. But again, in in practice, I mean, his throws, I mean, Keaton Slovis is one of the best pure passers I've ever seen. I mean, he throws the ball. You know, he had this one play. You know, they were over in the, uh, they were over in the indoor facility. He had one play where he was on maybe his own 20 or 30-yard line, and he threw a dime to somebody at, at about the 10-yard line on the other. So it's like, what, 60 yards in the air, 50, 60 yards in the air on the button. He scrambled. He made a throw across his body where, he, you know, he put it in a tight window. He looked amazing because he was wearing a red jersey. The lights weren't on, and he was wearing a red jersey. So I don't necessarily agree with the idea that, oh, well, you must, you know, see these things. Now, we've seen it in, in games now a couple of times with Phil. Now you start to say, is this, you know, or what is what we're seeing real or not? Um, but to me, and here's the thing, and, and I agree with you to this point, you go out and you get a quarterback, right, who – and home grow him and, and build him up and, you know, he becomes your guy. Uh, but if you're going to go get a transfer, you, the only way you're going to transfer is if that guy knows he's going to be the man or, in the case of uh, Christian Bayer, where the path is, look, we're going to bring in a one-year guy, you're going to learn, and then you're going to be the guy for, what, two or three years, you'll be definitely be the guy. So you have to make deals with the devil to get these guys, which is why you probably are right when you say they should go the other route. Yeah, or at least have those guys that are available to you so that you know, you're know you confident in, in making the switch if, if things aren't working out like they are right now. Um, Paul, I, I want to get to some quick hit topics here to wrap up the show. Penn State, Iowa this weekend. The whiteout game in Happy Valley. Iowa's three and zero. They're ranked, but they have some injuries. Are we going to learn anything about the Nittany Lions this week, or is it all about um, Ohio State at the end of the month and the next month? Uh, I would say that it's hard. You know, I mean, Penn State's going to beat Iowa at home, and you know, Iowa to me is the uh, is the least impressive three and0 team I've ever seen and they usually are the least impressive nine and two nine and three team or but they find ways to win games listen for whatever you want to say about Kirk Ferentz, you know I hate it I hate watching Iowa play I hate their style of football they're boring as hell but they're effective. He's found a formula that he can, you know, win and have a winning program at Iowa. But Penn State's got better players than Iowa. Penn State's at home. Iowa, to me, is 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 they're, they're challenged in a couple of areas. Penn State's athleticism, their speed, and all the other stuff is going to be superior. I expect them to win by 10 or more. Actually, I think the spread is, what, 16? 14 and a half last I checked. 14 and a half. That's a good number because I think Penn State is going to win that. Uh, we will be able to learn a little bit about Penn State up front, right? Probably a little bit more because uh, Iowa usually has a good offensive line and a good front seven. So we'll, we'll get the, to learn a little bit about Penn State at the point of attack. But let's face it, this Penn State team was always going to be 10-2. and two. It's Can they get to 11-1 and one or 12-0? and oh? That, 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 to me, is it's an unfair standard at times, but it's really where Penn State is at, at, at a program. Say whatever you want to say about James Franklin. He generally doesn't lose games he's not supposed to lose. He generally wins games against teams that he's got better players than. He generally wins at home. You know, it's been the two big names in, in the Big Ten have been the, the, the trouble spot for him. Um, and this year he has a team, it appears, that they have – the, the ability to get over that hump. But until he does it, I mean, I'd be far more shocked if they don't get to Ohio State undefeated, right? They should be undefeated, and they will be probably. So Iowa's a nice test, but I don't know that Iowa's all that good. I mean, they, they, they are what they are. 
They're the same team they always are. They'll have eight wins or nine wins, and that'll be that. Yeah, I'm picking Penn State to win, but I, I'll never forget my freshman year up there, Paul. It was a similar setup early in the season, September, white out in the Happy Valley. Iowa wasn't – not a lot of people were looking out for them, um, and they came in. Adrian Claiborne blocked that one punt, returned it for a touchdown, and it was curtains for Penn State, and Iowa ended up being the dark horse in the Big Ten. Um, you know, you never can discount this particular team with Penn State because they always seem to get Penn State at the worst possible times. And that's why I think they made sense as the whiteout choice. A lot of people wanted um, Michigan, but that was a noon game. Um, but you got to get people juice for this game because too many times they've caught Penn State by surprise. Um, so I'm still picking them, but you can't take them lightly. Paul, a couple Pirates questions for you here before we wrap up. Um, a lot of the critics have been filtered out of Pirates Twitter as attention has turned to the Steelers, attention has turned to the college teams. The people who are left talking about the Pirates in social media circles are generally the happy talk people who told me, wow, Quinn, Quinn Priester's velocity looks good. <laughs> he comes up, he gets whacked around. I mean, do you care if this team wins 75 games but has guys look like Quinn Priester looking like, for, you know, pardon my French, looking like hell? I mean, it's the guys that matter don't look good to me, Paul, other than maybe Brian Hayes and Brian Reynolds, but you're paying them good money to to be reliable it's these other guys that were supposed to be the missing pieces and to this point they just haven't been and it doesn't matter to me what the win total is absolutely i agree with you adam i agree 100 percent your your rotation next year right paul schemes we haven't seen we have no idea if he's going to be a good player or not right looks like it could be Keller is Keller. Quinn Priester is supposed to be one of these guys. Contreras is supposed to be one of these guys. Oviedo is supposed to be one of these guys. Ortiz is supposed to be one of these guys. I think you can make a decent pitching staff out of that, but how would we know? How, how do we know? Um, no, that's number one. Number two, I, I, I look around the diamond, right? And I say to myself, Henry Davis is supposed to be a big part of this future. Andy Rodriguez is supposed to be a big part of this future. I mean, O'Neill Cruz obviously has been hurt, but he's supposed to be a big part of the future. I think there's a lot more questions than answers right now with this team. And then there is the big one. Here's the big one. Who is at first base next year? So you've got a pitching rotation that, I'm sorry, I don't know that I feel good about any of those guys except for maybe Keller because you kind of know what you're going to get from him. You've got questions. I mean, Jack Sawinski, is he really your everyday guy? Uh, you know, can, can he hit lefties well enough that he's going to be your everyday guy? I don't know. Is Henry Davis, what position does he play? And and, and is there a position that he can play? You know, I I, I mean, he's supposed to be one of your, 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 your bell cows. You know, you got Nick Gonzalez tearing it up at double A. And is he going to come back up and get another shot or what next year? I mean, they've got a lot of questions. And the other part of it is, say they go 75, that would make them what? 75 and what? 87? Is that right? 75 and 87, I think is, would be the number. Something so, like that. Yeah, 75 and 87. You know what I look at? After a fluky, really hot start, they were 55 and 79. That's the way I would look at it. Is it fair? Maybe not. But life isn't fair and I deal in reality. And I could go back and I could point to about four or five of those games in that 20 and 8 start that they the the the, 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 the wins felt fluky and a little bit lucky. You know, guys like Connor Joe uh looking like Joe DiMaggio for a day. Or when they stole you remember when they stole 30 bases against the, yeah, exactly. the, the Dodgers that one weekend? Like yeah, and all, all the stolen base stuff while teams were trying to figure out the pitch clock and the rules and everything else. My point is I don't want to completely discount the Pirates. Yes, they, you know, if improved by 10 games, they're better than they were. You know, I get it. But I could also make the case, for instance, the Cardinals are a lot worse. And so that's probably made up some of the, you know what I mean? The Cardinals are a lot worse. The division in general is a little bit down. 
And so that could that could have contributed at least half of that. So I don't get all that excited whether they win 76 games or 73 games. Yes, they've made improvements, but guess what? They still have the same exact problems as they did. Yeah, and Paul, here's here's what I'd say about okay, you go up, let's say they win 76. That's that's what 16 additional wins or 14 additional wins. A lot a lot of additional wins, but right. One thing I remember reading a lot about during the last rebuild was marginal wins and how each win as you go up the win scale becomes tougher to get. It's fairly easy to go from 62 to 70, 75, even to 81. Um, but then each win above 80, how much harder, how much more money do teams have to spend to go from 81, 82, 83, 84, get to get to 90, to get to 98 like they did the one season? Um you know, that's that's where this rebuild is, is, to me, faltering. Is Can I imagine a world where this team looks decent and, and you can watch it all summer? Maybe they're contending for a wild card spot. Um, absolutely. I don't, I don't currently see the building blocks for a 98-win team, for a, a 93-win team. These, these, the, those teams we saw from 2013 to 15 that were really good and had a chance to – I thought if, if a couple breaks had gone their way, if they don't end up in the wild card game all three of those seasons, if they get into a series, you know, you could have imagined that team, that group winning a World Series. And that's not to say that they didn't have flaws or whatever and that justice wasn't served, but you could have imagined it. I cannot imagine it today. No. And, and that's – to me, my concern is that this rebuild peaks at like 85 wins, Paul, or, you know, 87 wins as – a team that's watchable, but just not good enough to really do anything. Or, God forbid, 82 wins or 81 wins. You know, I mean, that, that's, you know, and, and the thing about it is next year, 81 and 81 is not good enough to me, for me. Now, I mean, if you get to 75 wins this year and you only get to 81 next year, it's not good enough because, to me, it means you probably didn't do quite enough, period. So I, I feel like that's the important that's the important thing to remember is um, you, you, if they if they're really com committed to winning, they sh they need to go out and get another pitcher at least one starting pitcher. They need to go get a first baseman for sure, and they need to really think about well, do we need to figure out a, a what, you know well they need to figure out what they're going to do with Henry Davis, but do we need to go out and get a, a, a veteran right-handed option in, in the center field? And, and at least have a platoon with Sawinski and a right-handed guy. I don't know. I'm just saying there's some things they need to do if they really want to show us that they're committed to trying to win next year. And I don't have a lot of faith they'll do them. Yeah, I still – I've been saying all year this reminded me of 2003 where you had a lot of veterans, you know, carry them to 75 wins and and that there were clearly structural problems with the rebuild. Um I haven't been moved off of that at all. I think they're going to end up winning a few more games than I expected, but I think the general opinion holds. Uh, Paul, any final thoughts? We covered a lot of ground here. It was good to have you back from vacation. I don't want to keep you too much longer. No, I think we covered a lot of ground for sure. The one thing I did want to say, Adam, when we were talking college football, we always talk about the Sharps know something, right? Did you see Colorado is a plus – 21 is the last line I saw. Colorado mm -hmm. plus 21 against Oregon. Well, I just did my I just did my betting guide that you can see Thursday on postgazette.com, um, ladies and gentlemen, that oh the the sharps are fading the public massively. I think 63% of the bets are on um on Colorado to cover, and it's something like 70% of the money is on Oregon to cover. Uh, that's when you know that the wise guys in the desert or who knows, down at your local pub now that gambling's legal, maybe know something you don't. Yeah, I'm just saying that line, I looked at it and I said, boy, that is a line that really jumps off the page as a complete sucker's bet. Now, I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to touch it because I've outthought myself on this one, and that's usually when I get in trouble. But I'm like, that looks like a line that is designed to get a lot of people to bet money on Colorado. Uh, and frankly, I could see it going bad for Colorado. You take Travis Hunter out of the equation. Um, Colorado's defense stinks. You know, they, they're, they, 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 they're bad. Uh, I expect USC to light them up next week, too. So I could actually see a scenario where we're looking at, you know, Oregon winning this game, something like uh, 
you know, 48 to 24 or 48 to 21 or something. I could see that so easily happening. Um, so I just wanted your thoughts on that. That's all. I just they, every week I look at the lines and I say, boy, this is a weird line. And that one to me was a weird, weird line. Yeah, but, well, I mean, the, the data is there, Paul, because I, I look at that stuff. The, the Action Network tracks that, and that is what you said is absolutely what is happening in that betting market. So buyer beware on Colorado or Oregon. Yeah, I, that's when you said you stay away, that's that's probably a game I stay away <laughs> from too. Um, Paul, thanks for having me back. Just a quick tease. We're going to have Christopher Carter on the North Shore Drive Friday and Saturday. He'll have Brian Batko um, and a beat writer from the Las Vegas Raiders universe. And then – Paul and I will be here Sunday night to break down Steelers Raiders um, after the game. So I'm looking forward to that, Paul, and we'll see you all again soon. All right. Sounds good. We'll do it. We'll see you Sunday. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Apple Podcast channel for more podcast content. Click below for a special deal of 99 cents for a three-month subscription to the Pittsburgh Post Gazette.